is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Dandelion Dynasty Book 4, Speaking Bones, Chapters 11 and 12. In these chapters, our friends are on the run, and though it seems like they manage in the end to get away, it's a really high price they pay. It's brutal, guys. I wasn't happy about this at all. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. Thank you very much to Kyle for commissioning this episode. What's up, Kyle, if you're out there? So these two chapters, well, they're, they're Nalyufin's Pasture and Liukukyo Ukyukyo. Um, the second of these two starts us into part two of the book which is titled Thunder Awakened Forest, which I have to say is a pretty fucking dope name. So we start off Nalyufin's Pasture and I was very grateful because there was a part of me that was sort of worried. Sometimes this author, and this is by no means a criticism, it's just an observation. This author will bring us to the brink of like a really big climactic moment and then he will sort of bounce into another POV for a while and not come back to that climax for like a bit. And, you know, I can understand the restaurant wars thing being frustrating for folks last time, considering where we were with a lot of other storylines. Personally, looking back, I really enjoyed it, but I think it could have been significantly cut down. I do think, though, that I was like worried that that was going to be something we did with what's going on with Takval and Thera. And I was really relieved when we start this chapter and we're right, we're with them and they're in the midst of figuring out if they're going to flee over the ice. And uh, I just want to mention as well that when this chapter starts, it's only six months before the, the wall of storms opens. I... <laughs> Like, what are they going to do? I, I genuinely don't know how they're going to do this. So, Takval is talking to Kitos at the start of this chapter. His lips were blue and he was shivering uncontrollably. And I was sort of surprised by this because it seemed like we had managed okay with taking down, or at least standing up to the Liuku that have come after them. And that included, I thought, that they had supplies and were able to make fires and stay warm on their side of things. But evidently not. Um, they are on their last reserves of the food and the fuel. So they're looking at the ocean and basically what Quito says is, I know it looks solid, but that shit is full of real treacherous patches that are very thin and you won't know it's like dangerous until you're literally on top of it. So I do not think that we should go that way. But Thera is like, look, sometimes you've got to fucking just take your chances. And I don't think she knows what she's gambling here. So Tovo is woken up being told that they have escaped. And he sees that they have gone over the ice. He says that we have to go after them and all of the ice fleas, as he keeps calling them, tell him not to. And that not only are we in danger, but likely the dudes who are fleeing from us are going to die first because it is super dangerous and there is no way they're going to make it. So he, of course kills the people who stand up to him on this and everybody decides to fall into line. And uh, in preparation for a long chase, all the sleds were heavily laden with goods and warriors. Form a single column. That way the sleds in the back can draft in the wake of the sleds in front will move faster. And again, it's m mentioned that they want to object, but the, after the way he was so violent with people speaking back to him, 
they choose not to say anything. And when you get to the part where the ice caves in, clearly what they were thinking is it's better if we spread out width wise so that none of us is traveling over the same patch of ice multiple times. But that is what winds up causing the crack is like the sleds going one after the other directly over is wearing away the strength of the ice in the same spot. And I thought that was really fascinating because when it says like that they want to say something and they don't, I wasn't really sure why they were having reservations about doing it that way because I have always seen dog sledding done in single file, but that's because it's through the snow when I've watched it. So you're just traveling within the same space that's already been made in the snow ahead of you. This is a completely different situation and I just didn't really think about it. Um, so when Thera and Kitos led the convoy and scouted a, uh, for a safe path across, Takval's sled took up the tail so he could keep an eye on the pursuit. As his sled glided across the ice, a metal blade was pulled along behind. One of the few Dara weapons that had survived the long trek from Kiri Valley, it was now scoring a deep groove in the ice. And the people who are following the lead driver is a woman who is like, I just don't think that we should do this. And of course, fucking Tovo slaps her across the face, doesn't want to hear it. So they head out following a massive cut that he has already made into the ice. And uh, <laughs> Tovo, anybody could see the safest path was to follow the exact course taken by the rebels. A again, he's just not understanding the way, the nature of this threat. Normally, Going the same way as somebody who has gone before you, it would feel like if they came through safely, so will we. But the, there is an immediate wear that happens and he just simply doesn't understand or appreciate that. So it b buckles, a second sled crosses the ice holds, but begins to spider web. Another sled, this one driven by Tovo himself, screeched over the weakened surface. Tovo had surrounded himself with his strongest, biggest warriors, maximizing his own chances of landing the killing blow. The ice gave up. And the rebels look back and cheer because they hear this huge crack as the sled goes down. And Thera is like, "We let's stop and turn around so we can get a better look. And Kitos says that's not a good idea. It's sunny. We really need to get going. It's going to weaken more. And Thera says, we'll be careful, but we need to make sure. And I'm like, girl, why though? You really don't. I got really, really annoyed with her here. Like Tovo is not listening to people who know better and she isn't either. And this is what happened. Like, I'm just really mad at her for not fucking listening you are not in your element. Listen to the experts. And granted, there are times where you have to make a, a, a tough call, but this is like a very simple A to B, practical, reasonable, rational, like cause and effect situation that you really even shouldn't need much experience to be able to tell this is what's going to happen. So, um, Dozens of Liuku sleds, unable to pull away in time, had tumbled into the gaping maw. Thera couldn't help but let out a yelp of relief. The gods were with them. That was when the ice below their feet groaned and cracked. And I'm just like, girl, what the fuck? Like, come on. So she wraps her arms around Takval and she's like, it's not such a bad fate to die in the arms of someone I love. And he says, I told you that I would get you to Totten, and I never broke a promise and I'm not going to now. So Takval is directing everybody very slowly to move forward. And everyone manages until it's Takval's turn. Thorio and Kitos grab Thera, pull her back, and Thorio runs out there. The young woman rolled all the way to the edge of the hole. She tried to hand the rope to Takval, but his limbs were too stiff and his fingers too numb. The churning water subsided. He was drifting away and sinking. And this, the 
whole thing that happens here, like I often see depicted in, uh, in, in movies and television shows when somebody like falls under the ice, what they show is that like somebody falls through and the cold is such that it reforms the ice right above their head really quickly. And that when they get back to the surface again, they aren't able to punch through or the current carries them away from the hole. So they are able to get back up to the ice, but they are, you know, a couple of yards away from the opening and now they have to break through and it's not going to happen or the people who are going to help them are nowhere near them. But I appreciated that it's mentioning how he is so affected by the cold that his movements slow, because this is something that I personally forget is an effect. And I have never done any one of those like polar plunge things for me being cold is one of the worst things in the entire world. And even like people will talk about how being too hot is worse than being too cold because if you're cold, you can keep putting layers on yourself. But if you're hot, there's only so naked you can get before there's nothing to be done. And I understand that rationally that is, uh, you know, something that makes sense to say intellectually, but I have never experienced the kind of bone deep ache from heat that I do from cold. And even if you can put layers on yourself, there comes a point if you're cold enough where putting layers on doesn't help. The only thing that helps is sinking into a hot bath. That's the only thing that'll get me warmed up again. And if you're cold enough and you put layers on like, sure, maybe hours from now, once your body heat begins to create like pockets in that layer, then it will start to warm you. But it's certainly not an immediate thing. And it, it's just for me, the logic of it has nothing to do with it. For me, the experience of being and cold is also what kills people most often. I think it's something like 25% of deaths are, are from heat, but like 75 are from cold. Um, I'm talking about like temperature related deaths, not all deaths, obviously. So for me, being cold is absolutely miserable and I would never do one of those plunges. So I'm not speaking from that kind of experience here. You're going to laugh at me when I explain where I'm coming from on this. The closest to being submerged in water that is icy that I've ever been was when I worked at Whole Foods, I would have to do all of the prep for the fresh mozzarella for the pizza station. And the fresh mozzarella came in these huge tubs of several gallons. And the mozzarella was floating in whey. So, and they would be kept at a refrigerated temperature of like almost freezing because that was how you kept them the most fresh. And I would have to reach in and take these balls out and I would put them through the slicer. And that was what we would use on the top of the pizza. Best fucking pizza, by the way. And you would not believe how bad it hurts after three, four reaches into a bucket of water that cold. It starts to become absolutely excruciating. I was always startled by how fast I just would be like, I can't do it. And I would have to switch from one hand to the other because my my hands would begin to ache horribly and there was just so it was like such a small amount of submersion and it was so short I could just reach in grab it pull it out again and even so the the pain of it was genuinely shocking every time and this was a prep that I would do every day and I hated it I fucking hated it so that was what I kept thinking of in this scene the cold was shocking her skin had been ripped away. A thousand needles pierced her at once, throbbing, twisting, warming their way into the weakening flame of life that was her heart. The agony almost made her blank out before her raw nerves mercifully dulled. And honestly, I felt this like I just was like, this sounds like a fucking nightmare. Absolutely not. And she's trying to reach for him and she's so cold she can't move and she's starting to wonder what the point is of trying to move anyway and she's thinking about how 
everything that everybody does in this world leads to more death and more destruction and more war. People trying to exact vengeance on somebody else, kill the killers of the people who were killed before. And she's like, maybe I should just fucking let myself drown and let talk fall drown. Like who cares? She then remembered her time in the hold before light and shadow had resolved into shapes before sound and fury resolved into syllable and thinking breath before she had understood life and death and beauty and wonder and disappointment and heartache. If only she could return to that time to a time before awareness and confusion. And I really felt that, <laughs> you know, as you get older, there are times where you're just like, can I just not, like understand and be responsible for anything ever again. It would be super cool if I could just like return to the womb. She looked at Tokval. He was on his last breath, his head about to go under. He wasn't looking at her. He was looking toward the ice shore. Dimly, she heard Thera's voice. You promised. Come back to me. You promised. She saw no fear in Tokval's eyes, only regret and tenderness only acceptance and love as deep and eternal as the tides. And she's thinking about this. And then suddenly it says an image came unbidden to her mind, frozen foam flowers lifting off the tips of waves like dandelion seeds, brilliant crystal sparks in the wind and sun barely glimpsed before being dashed to pieces on the beach. They huddled together as though unaware of anything else in the grand universe, as though it was enough to have tinkled together, to have heard the music of one another's soul for a fraction of a moment. There is no need for philosophy or religion, no need for appeals to blood or affirmations of the gods. It is enough that we have loved and are loved. There is no meaning in eternity, only now only here. And I really loved that. That's been highlighted a number of times in my Kindle. It says the, uh, I think like 35, but yeah, that's kind of it, isn't it? The now. So she managed to cinch the rope around her, herself and talk wall passes out and they are managed to be pulled out. Um, Quito, Quitos and the others lit fires and swept the embers into auk and do dog skulls. Wrapping the hot skulls in skins, they tucked them into armpits around the torsos of the two chilled bodies, infusing them with the heat of life. And I was sort of like wondering, because I know that warming somebody too quickly who's been frozen is really dangerous for them. So I wondered if this does do good or if it is maybe harmful like i feel like these people would know you know but i have heard that like you might find an animal who has been partially frozen and it, your instinct is to put them into a warm bath to help them warm up but i have heard that is not the way to go that you should put them in a cool bath because the shock of warming them too quickly can do more damage so i don't know i was just sort of like actual fire feels like it'd be even more extreme but i don't know um, and you guys, I was so excited about Tovo sinking and we immediately find out that he fucking survived and I was so mad about it. Not all of him to be sure. I was like, ah, all right, I guess prolonged exposure to the sea in Nalufin's pasture would ultimately cost him his left arm as well as four blackened toes that shriveled and then fell off. Nonetheless, that made him far luckier than many of the thanes and warriors under his charge, who would never return from this expedition to the far north at all. It took two weeks for Tovo to recover enough of his wits to contemplate the next step. And he, like, they, they tell him, the sea is rock solid now if you want to go across. And he has learned enough to, like, scatter the sleds apart. And check the paths ahead instead of just, you know, going forward without checking anything and making sure. Um, 
Whenever the ice shifted or buckled and the loud snaps ripped through the silence, the Liyuku froze in place as though expecting to be thrown into the deadly maw of the ocean again. By the time they reached Spotted Heifer, the first island to the north, all traces of the rebels had been erased by intervening storms. Tovo looked to the north at the other distant islands and shivered uncontrollably. The idea of pursuing the rebels into this no-man's land seemed the very definition of madness. And the Ice Fleet lead driver is like, dude, they're dead already. If they're not dead in a crevasse, there's nothing to hunt or fish up here. They're going to die of starvation. And it's a real interesting moment that he doesn't get mad at her for giving an unsolicited opinion. He's just like, oh, thank God. Because he doesn't want to go. He has been cowed. And that is beautiful to see. So he orders a retreat. And they head south again. The optimism of the Liyuku wasn't unwarranted. After crossing the sea, the rebels found shelter in an ice cave. And while Thorio recovered, Takval was much less fortunate. He remained in a coma as a high fever raged throughout his body. This was such a bummer. It made me think of his son, what Tonto has gone through, and the fact that he, like, he went underwater and there was like this transformative thing for him. And then he had this horrible fever. Like there's a real parallel, you know? Um, and Thera and Kitos, he comes to her and tells her, we don't have enough food for the people. And she says to lower the rations, but he's like, there's also the dogs. If we don't keep them alive, there's no fucking way we're getting out of here. So she asks, if we allow ourselves to starve, how long do we have to give them food? And he says, three days, maybe. So she is struggling to try and keep Takval alive. Um, let's see. Even with careful rationing, food ran out on the fifth day of the vigil. Several of the warriors who had accompanied them this far had died from a combination of their wounds, the cold, and lack of nourishment. Kitos believed that the band had to start back toward the mainland if they were going to have a chance at all, but a storm was rampaging across the island and it was impossible to find their way in the blinding snow and ice. So they have to kill some dogs in order to eat them, which you guys, I know, but I just, I, I know how silly, but it just breaks my fucking heart so bad. It really kills me. Um, and she fasts and prays and she winds up having this vision and here's Kitos's voice. There is no food that we can get to and is remembering the way he said it. And she finally goes to him and says, what did you mean by that? And then we get some information about the way the native people here deal with trying to get food. And there are these really cool sharks, ice sharks, slow moving and filled with blood barely warmer than the surrounding water. These giant predators relied on stealth and camouflage more than speed and ferocity. They preyed on unwary toddling ox, careless sea dogs who mistook the massive drifting fish for reefs, and even the occasional sea cow. The lethargic sharks were easy prey for bands of nimble human hunters, and the ice tribes would have devoted all summer hunts to the fish except for one problem. The flesh of the ice shark was toxic. Even a small quantity, if consumed right after the fish would, was caught, would render an adult unconscious and could kill a child. But because up here you're desperate for food, they have experimented over centuries on how they can make it edible. Uh, the process involved digging a shallow trench in the ground, place the carcass inside, stuff the internal cavity with a pungent mixture of animal, flat, of animal fat and tongue-numbing seaweed, and then covering the ice shark with layers of gravel, sand, and rocks. In this shallow grave, the weight of the rocks and sand slowly pressed much of the toxic secretions out of the shark carcass, while the flesh, stewed in seaweed juice, fermented. 
Only after many months and sometimes years would the flesh be considered safe to eat. At that point, the hunters dug up the fermented flesh, dried it, and cut it into strips for storage. The result was a fatty preserve emitting a strong, revolting odor, but it tasted delicious and provided plenty of nutrients. Since the fermentation process took so long, sharks in one season would have to be left in their caches sealed away by ice in the frozen earth until the next summer. So I'm really curious, like this sounds like it's a method of preparation that is real. And I'm very curious about like where this comes from. And, and I'm, you know, the thing about fermented food is so often how nasty it smells. And then it is delicious. Like there's so many fermented things. I think about all the time how we have figured out the way to prepare certain things. And I'm just like, it is wild. The foods that we have finally managed to make edible that otherwise really wouldn't be. And how much like, how many mistakes there probably were along the way. So when he explains this to her, she's just like, well, can't we go find one and dig it up? Because he knows of one. And she, and he's like, do you remember how hard the Liyuku tried to get through the walls of the fortress you made out of ice? Like this is a, a, a huge thick layer, way deeper than that. And there's, they weren't able to get through it. There's no way we'll be able to. And Thera is like, wait a second. And it turns out they have gunpowder. So they managed to just blow a hole in the ground. Um, chunks of fermented shark flesh rained down. There was a giant hole in the frozen ground, like the opening to a cellar, promising full bellies for dogs and people. The unfamiliar flesh smelled so foul that the Dara and the Aegon both retched. But the food did give them strength, and the crisis was temporarily resolved. And I was like, amen to you guys for being able to make yourselves eat it. I know when you're hungry enough, you will do what you need to do. But it's still like, it's not easy to make yourself eat something that makes you feel like you're going to throw up, like, you know. But Takval is doing really badly. Sores and lesions began to appear on his skin. In spite of pungent, bitter medicines, uh, his fever didn't abate. And she's taking care of him and talking to herself about how she has failed. And this, this is really rough because, like, I feel like it, if there's... N when people talk shit about themselves or feel guilty about things, a lot of the time, books I've read, it feels like unwarranted. Like they're being way too hard on themselves, taking responsibility for things that are not their fault. But here, when she's blaming herself for a lot of things, I'm like, yeah, you fucking did do a lot of, you made a lot of mistakes. And I'm not like, I'm not saying that she's, cruel or stupid but it they were mostly her choices that led to where they are and Takval comes awake at this point and he says that he saw his mother in a dream all our friends who died with her in Kiri Valley and she realizes he's dying no spring is coming you'll get better I promise to get you to Totten, my breath, he whispered. I'm sorry I won't be able to keep my word. Don't let my breath fade like the whimpers of a slaughtered lamb in the scrublands. Don't let my blood freeze in darkness like a coward concealing himself under fallen comrades in battle. You belong to this land. You love the people of the scrublands as much as I do. Remember what you told me. Sometimes we have to demand that others make sacrifices and accept them. It's the grace of kings and the burden of Picus. She sealed her lips against his, and as they kissed, she blew her breath into his weakened lungs, willing as much of her strength into him as possible. Then she stood up and summoned Ajilek. Ugh, I was so sad, you guys. I really didn't think we were going to lose Talkfall. I really thought she was going to go back with him. I really, really did. <sighs> okay. Okay, so then we go to chapter 12. 
in the waters north of Rui and Dasu, near the Wall of Storms. The city ship Torioana's Gift drifted in the calm sea. And this is rough, you guys. Ugh, it fucking kills me. The fate of the oncoming war would be decided today, for the Wall of Storms was about to reopen, revealing the long-awaited reinforcements from Ukyo. I have to assume they're coming. They got the information out of Thera. She didn't intend to give it to them, but she did. I have to assume that they're going to get some reinforcements, and I was really hoping they wouldn't. And look... I am not blaming the Liyuku for wanting to live in a place that is more fertile, that is more, you know what I mean? Like, but I don't fucking want them here anymore. Like, just go back to where you came from is really the vibe. And that might be fucked up of me, but oh, well. So I'm really just firmly team Dara at this point. And it's really hard not to continue to be that way when you are with Kutan Rovo for any amount of time, because she is a fucking psychopath. Um, she just is like, there's no way that you can be a human being who enjoys the tortures that she inflicts. And you're not a psycho. She can dress it up in whatever fucking ideology she wants. And I believe that she believes in the ideology. Don't get me wrong. I don't think that she's faking that, but you can't, enjoy torture and not be a psychopath. I just don't believe that, you know? So, uh, this guy, she, they're, they're, you know, smoking Tolusa and chanting Dara Aki must be destroyed. And she is the captain and is, she is, is looking back at what she has done and it is a real, like, <sighs> she is so proud, you know? I don't know what to say beyond the fact that she is so happy with what she has done that she is literally in tears a couple of times, you know? It's like... It's just so fucking sick. I don't know what else to say about it. She's thinking of, of the people that they have killed and the tongues that they've cut out and the hands that they have amputated, the way that they have crushed people's spirits and faced down like uh, nobody speaks the language of Dara here anymore. And uh, there will be nothing to eat if you destroy the fields and force all the villagers into the army. We'll demand more tribute from Pawn. That will make us more dependent on them. All the more reason to build up the army so we can take what belongs to us when they refused. Tom Vanaki presided over these debates, vacillating like a banner in a storm. But in the end, she always sided with Kutan Rovo. What else could she do? Which, honestly, again, Kutan Rovo needs to be taken out and there has to be a way that Tom Vanaki can manage it. Like... There has just got to be. I can't imagine. I, it just feels like she's really lacking in imagination. You know? I don't know. This is a... Uh, it, it just it feels like a problem that I understand her wanting to... Like, what it feels like to me is that Tom Vanaki doesn't want to inflict violence on somebody that she sees as being on her side and ultimately being not necessarily right. I don't think she thinks Kutan Rovo is right, but Kutan Rovo is a symbol. And I'm worried that she believes that there is a portion of what Kutan Rovo is pushing here that needs to be preserved in order to keep up this like nationalist, if that's the word I want, kind of backbone to the movement and the war I don't know I just feel like there's ways to deal with her and it doesn't seem like Tom Vanaki is like even considering them but she's clearly working on something that's sort of secret I don't know um so let's see 
Kutan, Ro Kutan Rovo had discovered that Vokufirna was sheltering native scholars from her cleansing squads by disguising them as his slaves. One of these Dara Ra'aki word scar carvers under torture had confessed an even more damning fact. Vokufirna had continued to write poetry in classical Anno and called the native scholar his master in composition. And I am so bummed, you guys, because you guys, yeah, I, this is like the one dude who remained, who was standing in defiance of Kutan Rovo. And the fact that there's something really insulting to me, and I don't know if this is just me, but there is something about the fact that we don't even get to see him get taken down. It's the fact that it happens like off page and we hear about it. And it, it just feels like really disrespectful. You know what I mean? I don't know. I just, I took this really hard. Like I was very surprised at my own reaction and how upsetting it felt to me to not even get to see how this all went down. And at the same time, what kills me is that I don't, want to see it. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, it just, it felt like I, I was in this place of, of being angry that he was, he, he was handled without warning and then immediately relieved that I didn't have to watch it. And then going back to being like angry about it. And I don't know, I really don't like, <laughs> I don't know what to say about it. It just seemed for me like this is, is the one dude that I had put some of my faith in. I think that's where really what it comes down to is that I was holding out that this guy was going to somehow manage to help get things back on the right track for Tom Vanaki. And he would be her one ally in the midst of all this. I, I think that's really what it was, was like, I had a, an idea of the way he was going to be an instrumental part of like fixing things. And I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna get it, man. He was just taken off the board. It's like that part in, uh, in, the Shining, where, you know, the old man, the black man comes all the way to help them. And you really think this is the dude who's going to, like, turn it all around. And then he just gets killed as soon as he walks in the door, like, literally has barely walked in the door. And everything just you had been anticipating this rescue that doesn't happen. I feel like that. that. I don't think that I quite realized how much I had riding on that dude and the way that I saw him as the potential savior of everybody. But finding out not only that he is just out of the picture at this point, but the way that he was tortured and the fact that up until the end, he does not back down. This motherfucker is out here like, fine, kill me, whatever. I'm not doing anything you say. I'm not turning my back on these people. I'm not denouncing them. No, I'm not going to light that fire. Because the whole like, the way that this goes is that she is feeling like she doesn't want to kill him because she, he is one of the Liuku. And for her, that makes him sort of sacred. You know, like this, the, she is very, very serious about the fact that the Liuku are off limits and shouldn't be hurt. And even though he's a traitor, she's like trying to find a way that he doesn't end up dead, which is, uh, I, I, I think I believe her, you know, it's really tough because you're in her head. So she's an unreliable narrator, granted. And, she, you know, how much of what she says can you really trust? And I try and keep that in mind. 
it does feel like she means it though when she says that she doesn't want to kill him she doesn't want to be put in the position where that's what she has to do however there is a point later where everybody is talking about how if something is going to happen to Tan Vanaki that maybe she should be in charge and she insists that's not what she wants and that anybody who is like talking about that is sort of missing the point and she is is claiming like in terms that felt very genuine no that's not what I want and I can't believe that you misunderstand me so badly that you would say that this is where we're headed but at the same time, when somebody is like requiring his people to build statues to her that they like worship and pray to, she rewards him for that. And she's openly rewarding him. It's not like a secret thing. It's a very public thing. And so I'm like, I really can't decide the truth of how she's feeling because a part of me thinks that she believes she doesn't want this and then she gives a completely different message by rewarding people who are building literal idols to her you know i don't know what to think it feels like it, maybe she just isn't sure what she wants either you know i don't know what to make of it but i don't know i don't know I really don't. I'm like so torn. Um, anyway, all right. So I'm sorry, guys. I'm getting all all off the path here because there's so many things sort of – this isn't so much a like cause and event section. It's more a her thinking back on things sort of section, which means that you get a lot of um, of mixed – like things are mixed together and not told in necessarily a straightforward timeline. So it can be a little bit difficult to talk about it linearly because it's not done in a linear way. Um, so it was with a grieving heart that Kuchan Rova prepared to execute this traitor, but Gozhan, desperate to save her last major political ally, interceded with the Peiki. Oh my God, I'm talking about him and he's not even dead. I forgot. He's made into a slave. So maybe there's something that will, but like, nevertheless, it feels like he's been taken out of play. If he comes back, it's going to be a major thing. You know what I'm saying? I thought he was going to be able to do something from within the, the structure of the politics here. And it doesn't look like that's happening at all. Um, yeah, here it is. She had done everything not for personal ambition, but to push Tom Vanaki into fulfilling her duty to realize Pekyu Tenryo's dream, turning Ukyu to Asa into a new paradise for the Liyuku people. Couldn't she see that? More than anything else, she was comforted by the current state of Ukyu to Asa. Only the speech of the scrublands could be heard in Creefy now. Um, and every Togotan child saw their highest goal in life as becoming more Liyuku. Which, yo, that one really fucked my head up. There is just something about the knowledge of, like, any child who is mixed having it drilled into their heads that there is one way for them to be. That really bummed me out, kids. And, I mean, again, it's it's kind of funny the ways in which I have moments of, like, that's a weird part to get upset about with all the other things that are going on, Natasha. And I fully admit that, but I can't deny that it got my attention. That moment was just sort of, Oh, sweetie. Oh, honey. I'm so sorry. You know? Um, so, okay. This, this is when she starts crying. She was fighting for their children too, and she would bear any trial to ensure a secure for future, a secure future for all Liyuku in this treacherous land. And today she would welcome more Liyuku blood. Having been dispatched to guide Kuju's reinforcement fleet to Krifi, she and her crew would be the face of Uku Taasa. 
It was up to them to impress upon the newcomers how much Tanbanaki had already succeeded in her mission, and to demonstrate the blossoming of the Liyuku spirit in this barbaric realm. So then we get this really horrific scene. <sighs> I don't like. I don't even want to talk about this. I really don't. That's where I come down on this. Well, suffice to say. They have all of these people who are Dara that are drugged. So they're very compliant, not really aware of where they are. They've been given some of that, like that berry that causes hallucinations and whatnot. And there's a really interesting thing here that I thought was like, particularly kind of caught my attention in order to fully revitalize the Liyuku spirit dulled after years of accommodationist misrule and compromise. It was necessary to, in some sense, out Liyuku, the homeland by reviving these customs from a mythical and even bloodier age. She and her followers could instill in the natives even more terror and boost the co cohesion of the Liyuku conquerors. And that, I found pretty compelling. I'm not going to lie. Like that for me actually kind of made sense. And it bummed me out a little bit that it made so much sense. But the idea of just going to an extreme so that you can reach, uh, you can, it's basically, she's like, we went into the negatives and so now we have got to overcompensate in order to regain the position that we had been in before. I was like, oh, man, I hate that. I kind of see what you mean. And I also feel like I have seen this sort of reaction. Like, this is what it feels like to me is going on in American politics a lot is that we've got people out here who are espousing beliefs and and obscenely backward ideologies that I don't think they even really believe, but everything is getting so fundamentalist that they have to pretend to in order to get support from that side. So things are growing more and more extreme because of people growing more and more fearful of the direction we are heading. And it's just very upsetting. I don't know. This whole thing is like, I know that mostly this is about a colonizing force and the way that they handle their people. And it's just a surface value, like on a surface level, you can take it at face value and that's all it is. But there are parts of this that I feel like are the way some people do feel today. And I just, I really, I hate this. Like, Everything about how, not only how she thinks, but how effective it apparently is, you know, it's working. And that's the part that makes me so cringy is the fact that she has gained a kind of power that their own ruler seems unwilling to kind of countermand. That is truly terrifying. So she does this chant and then says, let the music begin. And by music, she means the screams of the people. And they basically break bones and eviscerate until people can't scream anymore. And then they kill them. And it, it, there was a part of me that kind of appreciated the ending. By the time the ritual sacrifice was complete, the last victim silent and dead, more than a few of the Naros Votan, Naros and Kulex were trembling. Even for battle-hardened veterans, the intensity of the ritualistic torture they had had to inflict and witness was overwhelming. And I really was hoping maybe she went so far this time that they're starting to see. I don't know though. And then we have this. She claps her hands and these shamans come out with bowls of berries. And 
The assembled warriors grabbed handfuls and chewed them as though satisfying a desperate hunger, careless of the blood-like juice spilling down their chins. And I was like, hold on a second. And then we get, Kuchan Rovo laughed with pleasure. These Tolusa berries were a lucky find. The pirates were actually good for something. And I was like, oh, this is not what I was expecting, kids, at all. So Kuchan Rovo had always been like not happy about Tom Vanaki dealing with the pirates. She understood the logic of it, but she didn't like it. And then she starts to realize that there, some of them are uh, smuggling Tolusa berries. While she wasn't surprised the plant had become established on other islands of Dara, she was amazed at how round and lush the berries were far more appealing in appearance than the familiar variety in military controlled patches. You guys like, I, 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 I will tell you this. I got, I had that moment, but here I'm like, still not quite getting it They're It's because of the way they're grown. Like this is a purposeful, it just, Oh my God. 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 Tolusa was vital to the health and breeding of Garinifins. And Ghost Tan Ryoto controlled the meager supply because Tom Banaki entrusted the Garinifin force to her. However, Tolusa was also an important component in religious service. If Kutan Rovo could secure her own independent supply, she would be one step closer. So she is getting this from Gia, but she doesn't know it. And the nameless spy, he found out about the smugglers and wanted to report the finding to the Pekyu. Kutan Rovo caught him just in time, and she tries to persuade him not to tell her. He refuses to keep it secret. She killed him. And I'm kind of like, did she, though? There's a part of me that wonders if she thinks she killed him and didn't. Like, that guy is fucking slippery. I feel like he would be able to fake. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Anyway. Um, when Kutan Rovo, what Kutan Rovo feared most of all was the man represented Tom Banaki's eyes and ears and could tell the picky things without going through Kutan Rovo. She had all already gradually replaced the guards and servants around Tom Banaki with people she trusted, but she had not been able to persuade Tom Banaki to assign the spy to her command. And I love this. Kutan Rovo believed it was important to protect the PQ by controlling the information she received. Facts were never found in nature, but shaped by mindset. There were simply too many facts. The harvest figures, the number of natives being killed, the health of the herds and flocks that required the proper context and interpretation to be correctly understood as successes of hardliner policies. Oh, boy. I mean, I don't even need to say it, do I? Like, oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. Tom Vanaki often showed an unfortunate resistance to the necessary hardliner mindset. To allow the PQ to be exposed to information without proper filtering, therefore, was to leave her vulnerable to deception and manipulation. It's just wild, because, like, again, I believe Kuchan Rovo believes this. I do. I don't think she's lying to herself. There are people who would do that, but I don't think she's one of them. I think she fully believes when they do it, it's manipulation. When I do it, it's the truth. And that's what's so fucking scary. When viewed in the proper light, killing the nameless spy was a supreme act of loyalty. She had blamed the death of the spy on native saboteurs and executed a whole village as vengeance to comfort the grieving PQ. And I'm just like, oh, again, how much of, is he dead? Like, it would be really perfect if she thought he was dead. There is no better situation for Tanvanaki, to be honest, than if Kutan Rovo thought her number one most competent spy was dead. I'm really hoping he isn't. 
Um, the pirate berries turned out to be much more potent than the traditional variety, and those who ingested them reported longer, more intense dream hazes that brought them closer to the gods. She saw the new berries as a, a kind of sign. And basically is like, if the berries can grow better and bigger here, then what about us? The pirates were vague about where they obtained them, and Kutan Rovo understood their reticence. No matter, once all of Dara was conquered, the Liyuku would discover the source and have as much as they liked. Oh, man. Is, like, Kutan Rovo is distributing these. I can't tell if she has any. Because if she is eating them, that's going to go a whole other way. If it's her people only, that'll be different. Um, let's see. The native Weirapin, uh, for instance, received some Tolusa berries when he came up with the idea of requiring every native village to construct an elaborate statue of Tambanaki. You know what I'm realizing? I was saying that this didn't reconcile with her saying she didn't want to rule. But this was a native that made these statues, not one of her own people. So maybe for her, that's a completely different scenario and, and totally appropriate when it's her own people trying to elevate her in that way. That is what feels wrong to her. Um, and the berries are just like, I, I, you guys, I had kept thinking that she, that Gia was planning to poison the food and that this was going to become something that every random person who ate any of the food that came from Dara was going to become addicted. The Tolusa berries specifically, I had never even considered that. And it's a really like clever idea in some ways, because they are going to be the only ones allowed to eat them. It's considered a sacred food. So like, it's not regular Dara you know, they're not going to be that kind of like casualty. We're only going to have upper level folks. Although I just realized I said that, but she gave some to one of the Dara natives. I, I just, oh, fuck shit. See, this is a way, reason like shit like this is not, you can't depend on how it's going to be distributed. Fuck. Mm. Um, the only people who objected were the surviving accommodations who ironically argued such extensive use of the Tolusa was Unliyuku. Ugh, man, I am so curious where this is going to go. Like, are these berries the full potency yet, too? Because Gia created more and more intense drugs. And I can't figure out, like, is this berry the max? It's in its pure, like, you know, I was comparing what she was making to crack and crack is highly processed. It's not like a naturally occurring substance. So I, that's what I thought it was that she was creating something super processed through chemistry, basically. And if it's a pure natural form in a berry like this, that is a really surprising outcome. I mean, how much was she able to, or are the berries just poisoned? Are the berries not like, you know, granted they look rounder and fuller and more plump and delicious, but it might just be they're being grown in like a greenhouse and then they're being tainted with a drug that is made via chemistry. And it's not the berries themselves. It's the berries that are spiked. And she's going to continue to up the dosage that's been added to them. I don't know. We haven't had a Gia chapter in so long. I'm dying. Um, so Kutan Robo begins to chant. And everybody begins to chant with her. The wall shimmered as though ready to reveal the next stage in the grand conquest of Dara. At that moment, somewhere to the east of Toriorana's gift, Admiral Than Karukono, and I won't lie, the fact that we have Karukono and Kutan Rovo got real confusing to me for a second, y'all. Um, Than Karukono paced the deck of the tiny fishing barge, Torunoki. Given the expiration of the peace treaty with unredeemed Dara, 
everyone from Empress Gia and Prime Minister Kobo Yelu to the junior analysts in the College of Advocates thought it best to refrain from any action that might be interpreted by Tom Vanaki as provocation. Thus, Than couldn't be escorted by warships, including mechanical crewbins or airships. He was here to observe, not start a fight. So he's looking at the wall and he knows, like, Zomi said it's going to open today, then it's going to fucking open today. But he doesn't know what's going to come through. And he is just like, I really hope Thera managed this. I really, really hope she was right. And the chapter ends with Thankaru Kono squinted at the wall of storms, waiting for the fate of Dara to be changed once again from the outside, which is a really interesting sentence. Like the, the idea that this is something nobody in Dara really has any control over. They can send Thera in. They don't know what happens to her after she crosses this wall. They don't know what's going on inside. Like the, the Lyugu lands are essentially a fairy tale in a lot of ways, you know? Everything that's happened to Thera, too. I mean, it couldn't possibly be worse the way things have gone for her. So I have no idea what to expect. I really don't. I'm over time, so I better wrap this up. But these are some intense chapters, y'all. And I'm really, really glad how much shorter the sections I'm covering are because I'm able to like stretch and really talk about things, which I appreciate. So thanks for that, Kyle. Um, I'm going to like start the next section right away an audiobook because I'm dying to know what happens. And also I feel like we're not going to get another Gia chapter anytime soon, but I really want one. Like I'm fucking dying to know how this is going. I understand that she is using Huto to distribute this, you know, I'm getting that, but I'm, I want to know the mechanics of how this is working and, and exactly how it's made. So, all right. Thank you guys so much for listening. Thank you, Kyle, for commissioning this. Appreciate you a lot. Until the next time, toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.